It's great to see you. Welcome to week number two of a series that we are calling simply The Word, bringing life to your life. Because I know that in a lot of our lives that we need some more life. And I honestly believe that that life comes from the Word of God and everything that the Word of God produces within our life. So my father, Pastor Steve, started us last week with an amazing message about making the Bible come alive in your life, and it was awesome. If you want to hear last week, if you missed it, go, go back to our YouTube page or, uh, or our website and pick that up. But this series is just to help us understand and know our Bible, because I want you to love it. I want you to be consumed with God's Word. You say, well, Micah, why is that so important? Because of something that Jesus said, all right? He said that everyone who hears these words and not just hears them or has a Bible, but to the person who figures out to put it into practice. If you put these words into practice, it's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, one of the motivations for this series um, is it's not just for you to know cognitively to learn the Bible. I really want it to be in you. So this reality happens in you. Because what the Bible says, and, and look, it's kind of bad news, but it's true. The Bible says you're going to have storms in your life. Amen. God, Micah, you should be more positive. Well, I am positive. I'm positive you're going to have some bad days ahead. Amen. The Bible says storms are coming. But it doesn't have to impact us the way it has in the past if we have a life built and is solid on God's word. So that when you do have that day, it doesn't impact you like it does the rest of the world. Amen. Okay? So this is really just a series to really help your life and help make it better, bring life to your life. So today, I want to talk about just understanding the Bible. Okay? And I'm not just talking about in your mind. I want you to grow in your knowledge, in your experience with God's word. I want you to get closer to it. And ultimately, I want you to love it. So it's not just a discipline anymore, but it's something that you look forward to doing. Amen. It's like, well, Mike, how do I get to that place? Because I don't really want to read the Bible, just to be honest. I want to want to read the Bible, but I don't want to. Be. Anybody other than me ever been there? Amen. Amen. Watch this. When you understand something, you love it more. It's like my wife, Melissa. When we first got married, I loved her. But man, I did not understand anything that was going on. But the more I understood her, the easier it was to love her, to grow in my love for her. We've been married over a quarter of a century. And I'm still learning, growing in my understanding, and falling more in love with her. And, and I hate to tell you, women, you're hard to understand a little bit. I'm just saying. Reminds me of a story. There's this guy. He's in Wilmington walking along the beach and he sees a genie bottle. He grabs it, he rubs it, and out poofs a genie. And the genie says, hey, I'll give you one wish, whatever you want. And the guy says, oh man, you know, I'm grateful because I've always wanted to go to Europe, but I hate flying. So if you'll build me a bridge from here to, to Europe, I'll go. And, and the genie says, man, that's, that's quite the request. I don't even, I don't know if it's possible. I mean, could you imagine the steel and the labor and, and the concrete and the rebar? I, I mean, for a bridge that long? I mean, you're going to have to ask me something else. I don't know that I could do that. The guy says, okay, well, uh, help me understand my wife. And the genie says, would you like one lane or two? <laughs> but seriously, the more you learn to understand the Bible, the more you will love your Bible, the more you will want to read your Bible because you understand how it works and how it applies to your life. So that's my objective today, is to help you understand your Bible more so that you can love it. So I wanna help you understand the Bible, all right? So the word Bible, it simply means book, all right? And it's because the Greek word for Bible is biblios. There's actually a Greek city called Biblos, and the, they use that name, and this is why, is because Biblos was the number one importer of papyrus, which is where we get the word paper. And so they were paper manufacturers, and that's actually how the Bible got its name. But what's interesting is, is that the Bible, it's not a little B book. It's a capital B book because it is a book like no other. It is the most read book in all of history. It's the best-selling book of all history. It's the most translated book in all history. And, and, and watch this. 
all time marks itself on the truth of God's word. It is a book like no other. And actually next week, I'm going to teach a message that's going to basically show you how... the show you how you know that the Bible is valid and actually accurate. And so it's going, to be how, it's going to be on how to know you can trust the Bible. And I'm going to tell you, you can. You can believe and you can even use the Bible in conversation because right now I know there's a big attack on the Bible. Okay? And so next week, you'll be convinced as we go through all the proof that the Bible is actually accurate and that it works. It'll work in your marriage. It'll work in your money. It'll work in your business. God's way, it works. It's always worked. And you want to put that to the test. And if you do, you'll see. But today, I want to help you understand the Bible. I want you to get it. And this is the best way that I know how to do it in such a short amount of time. Okay? Here's one of the greatest revelations for me was that the Bible, it's not written in order. Okay? It's not in chronological order. That the books of the Bible are actually grouped in types of books, okay? And that makes it kind of difficult. If you're just trying to read through from Genesis to Revelation, if you're just going from cover to cover, it doesn't really read that way, okay? But if you understand how it reads, I think it'll help you understand it better. So I'm going to break it down for you, okay? So that is in the Old Testament, the first five books are called the law, they're the law books. And it's called the law because that's when the law was given. And it was all written by Moses. Okay? And of course, this is the story of creation, Joseph, Moses, Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, all the way up to the point where they would enter into the promised land. So it's the first five books. It's called the Pentateuch. All right? So now the next section is a really a fun read because it is a historical section of the Bible. It's 12 books in all. From Israel's history, after Moses, they're entering to the promised land, right? You know, Joshua fought, fought the battle of Jericho. The walls come tumble. You, all right. <laughs> Nobody went to Sunday school. All right. So that goes all the way through to Esther, which is actually the end of the New Testament, which is, or the end of the historical section, all right? So like Nehemiah and Esther is where the Jews are actually brought into Babylon. Remember the series we did on, on culture in Daniel? So it actually ends uh, in Esther in the Old Testament. But then there's another section that's a poetical section, all right? So you could actually insert, insert some of these Psalms into 1 Samuel in the historical section. And, and actually, it's really cool. I've read a chronological Bible before. It actually exists. You can, you can buy it in paper. You can get it online. Actually, the YouVersion app where we do the one-year Bible, it actually has a chronological Bible. And what they do is they insert the Psalms where they were written in the stories in the historical section. It's really cool. And then you get another section that's called the prophetical section. There's 17 books. Once again, you can insert these prophets. They all lived in the historical section. All right, that helped me a lot to really understand how this all works. And there are five major prophets. And, um, and even the prophetical books are broke into two sections, right? You have Isaiah through Daniel. These are the major prophets. And that's not because they were more important. It's just because they were longer, all right, and then you have what's called the minor prophets. There were 12 in all, and, and not, once again, not that they're minor, but they were just shorter. Not like me, but the books were short, okay? So that just helps you to know, um, yeah, okay, this is how, you know, this all fits into the story. And then after that, you get 400 years of complete silence at that point. And then after that 400 year gap, you have Alexander the Great, and then you have the Romans that come in and take over. And that's where the Christmas story in the New Testament starts is where the Romans are in charge. And that's where your New Testament starts. All right. And of course, the New Testament begins with what's called the Gospels. Now, the word gospel simply means good news. And the good news was that Jesus, the Messiah, was actually coming. And so there are four books, and those are four different accounts of the exact same story. All right? And so after Jesus was resurrected, went to heaven, and then the church was established, and the historical record of the first church is the book of Acts. All right, so now you're back into a history section of the Bible. And that's a lot of fun because we like to try to model ourselves after this New Testament church. We are inspired by. We want to model ourselves after this New Testament church. In fact, our whole vision, belong, believe, become, comes out of Acts chapter 2, 41 through 47, where it describes how the New Testament church ran. All right, because... We believe that the same things that happened then can actually happen today. Is that right? Yep. All right. 
So during this history, churches were planted and then letters were written back to those churches and those letters were called epistles. Now that's just a fancy word for letter, okay? Now a lot of the church planters like Paul wrote these letters back to those churches that, that they established during the history section of Acts. So these letters would be inserted somewhere in a chronological order somewhere in the book of Acts. All right, so you got 20 letters, all Romans through Jude. They give us instruction, doctrine, teach us how to live. And every one of those is valuable. And that's why we study them so much is because they teach us how to live in the church today and how we should run the church today. All right, and then the last book of the Bible, the 66th book of the Bible is called the book of Revelation. Apocalypsis is what the word revelation means in the Greek. And it, it comes from, well, that's where we get the word apocalypse, which means this is the prophecy of the last days and then all of eternity. And so you get the picture of how all this is going to end one day. And it was revealed to John, who was one of Jesus's disciples, while he was actually banned. He was in solitary confinement to an island because they couldn't kill him. They boiled him in oil. He wouldn't die. So they just put him away on this island and he wrote this book. And so I'm going to give you a little picture of this book today, but that gives you kind of an understanding of how it's all broke down. And I think it helps you understand how the Bible is put together and it will help you love it. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you a big picture of the Bible. You're going to see the symmetry of the word of God. It's beautiful how it's architected it and how God actually architected it. It's amazing. All right. So it's a mirror image and it tells the whole story. It's the plot of the Bible. As a filmmaker, I'm always thinking in, in stories, right? And so this is the plot of the story of humanity that's put in the Bible. And here we go. It's in mirror form, okay? I'm going to show you how. That the whole story, Genesis, in Genesis 1, it begins with God and righteous man in paradise, all right? Righteous meaning he was perfect. God made Adam completely sinless, perfect, all right, so we had perfect fellowship with God. There was no shame, no guilt. Even the garden was perfect. I mean, they didn't even have rain. There were no rainy days. Fountains would actually feed the ecosystem from underneath. It was a perfect world. And watch this, as God always intended it, and this is God's picture, what he wants, that we have this open fellowship with God, that we get to enjoy all that he has created. All right, so then in Genesis chapter three, after this, Satan and sin enter. And what sin does is sin always separates. It's a good way to remember it. Sin separates because then man began to become unholy. God was holy, man was unholy, and unholiness can't be in God's presence. And watch this, a gap was created. Distance was created. In fact, some of, some of us today, some of us came to church today, and even though you're, you're here, you're faithful to church, there's still a gap between you and God, and it seems huge, and it's massive. Well, sin does that, and we've all sinned, but if you've never had that sin reconciled or dealt with, you still feel the gap of that. Right. And anytime sin takes over our lives, chaos will ensue. All right, so, and that's what happened in this story because the next thing that happens is they got so chaotic that God says, look, I gotta start over. So the world is judged and destroyed. That's the, the story of Noah and the flood. God said, this is a mess, this is chaos. So he found one righteous man. Noah says, found favor in the eyes of God. And God says, all right, look, I'm gonna wipe all this out. I'm gonna repopulate the earth and I'm gonna do it through this guy, Noah. Well, that still didn't work because they just went straight back to their old ways in their sin. Chaos came right back. And so then the second attempt for them to get their own lives together is for them to all come together and build a tower to God. It was called a tower to, of Babel. And they said, well, if we can't reconcile you know, our, our own sin, we'll just try to be like God. We'll try to get to heaven where he is. So they literally created a one world government system. Same language, same goal. You, you, we can't get close to God, so we'll just overtake God. Hmm. So we'll see if we can get to, to him that way. Well, that didn't work either. And so, the, and the, the actual remnants of the Tower of Babel, you want to trust your Bible? You can still go visit it. It's there. 
So anyway, God, that wasn't working. God confused their languages, and so then they split off into nations, and God created his own system. He created his order, and that order was called the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? God said, hey, look, I'm going to take one people group and I'm going to set it in order with the hope that they would follow me. So he called them God's holy people. And that is what the rest of the Old Testament is all about, is God's system. He sent law, he sent instructions, he sent ways to get to him, he sent sacrifices, he created a holy people. Well, that didn't work either. And the problem was this. And this is critical for us to understand if we're going to understand our Bible. Up until this point, it was all external. In other words, they had a law, but they had it here, but they didn't have it here. They didn't want to do it. And so even though they're trying to obey it, they don't like it because it's not in their heart. And in fact, there's a very simple way to look at your Old Testament and New Testament. And one of them is the Old Testament is all about the external. The New Testament is all about the internal and what God's doing in your heart. It's the New Testament. So you insert God's total plan here. In fact, God had this plan all along because he had to have all of this in order to convince us that, look, you're not going to be able to do it externally. My ultimate, God's ultimate plan was this, Jesus, that he was the hope of the world. In fact, I put the temp, Jesus at the top and the center of this mirror image just to tell you it, the whole thing is all about Jesus. All right, so Jesus would say, yeah, you've sinned, but the only way you can get rid of that is to actually pay for it yourself. In other words, watch this. Hell is not a place where God sends people he's mad at. I know you've been told that, but that's not true. Watch this. It's a place where people pay for their own sins if they want to, but you don't have to. Because Jesus came and he said, hey, I'll pay your bill, but I'll do more than that. I'm actually going to leave you my Holy Spirit and the power that I used here on the earth. And before the law was written on tablets, external, but I'm going to write it on your heart. I'm going to change you from the inside out. I'm going to do a transforming work on the inside of you. And so instead of having the 12 tribes of Israel, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to create the church through the 12 disciples. And these are going to be my holy people. And I'm going to do it differently this time because now I'm going to write my law on their hearts. You can read that all through Hebrews chapter 8. You can go study it. Right at the end of Hebrews 8, he says, I have a new way of doing it, a new covenant, it's called. And he says, now this time it's going to be different. And in fact, he says, look, you won't even have to teach people to do this. He says, when you accept me as your Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, he will actually, the teacher will be on the inside. You'll know it because it's written on your heart. Amen. It's a miracle. And as you know, watch this, we're living in this, this is where we are right now, okay? Or is, or I'm sorry, no, right here is people are rejecting the church at a whole new level. This is where we're at is we're rejecting that. And some of you that are older, you remember when the Bible and prayer was accepted everywhere, yeah. right? It was the standard for our country. But today, it couldn't be more polar opposite and the world is going their way again. And look, I don't even have to read the Bible to tell you this. You can see this on the news is this is where they're going. This is the next step. They're going back to a one world government system. And the Bible says that the Antichrist is going to be the final broker of this system. And that alliance, right now, it's actually already beginning to happen. It's aligning with biblical prophecy to the T. And that's all happening. And I personally believe that that whole thing could play out in our generation. I mean, we're seeing this one world government being established and it's sped up as well. So what will happen is the Antichrist will institute a buying and selling system, one currency, we're already seeing this, that you can use across the world. And then what comes after that is the mark of the beast, where you're going to have on your hand or in your head, his mark, and you won't be able to buy or sell without it. You go to Walmart, beep, and that's it. And you know, God's going to see this and, and he's going to bring his church to heaven and he's going to come again and he is going to judge and destroy the world again. But this time, not with water, like with Noah, but with fire and purification of the world. He's going to actually redo the whole thing. But this time, he has a remnant of his people that, watch this, that have them 
have him in their hearts this time. That's what make all this different. All right, so then the Bible, I mean, uh, God is then gonna bind up the devil and Satan and sin will exit the world. So they entered, now they're gonna exit. And then what happens is, watch this, we get to spend eternity, not in a celestial retirement home, guys. You're not gonna be playing the, the harp in a choir. No, you're gonna have God and redeemed man back in paradise. Watch this. The closest English word we have for the Greek and Hebrew word of paradise, watch this. Resort. <laughs> Can I get an amen there, somebody? Who doesn't want that? That's right. And so, in fact, we, we call it the afterlife, but it's actually not the afterlife. That's life. We're in the before life. Amen. All right, that's true. People say, well, I'm just going to the afterlife. You know, I'm going to heaven. I was living, but now I'm in the afterlife. Just going to haunt people, I guess. I don't know. No, none of that. Watch this. I want you to see this picture. It is the mirror image in the Bible. And we need to know both how to read our Bible. See, this is how the Bible reads. And this is how you need to live and realize that you're a part of the history that is the Bible. See, the history that the Bible talks about, it's still being lived out in us, okay? Now, I wanna close out with a couple thoughts and we'll put all this together. And so here's the question. Who is, if this is the plot of the Bible, who's the hero of the story? Who's the hero? Because every story needs a hero, right? Uh, somebody said, well, we are. You know, we're, all this is about people and God reaching people. Not even close, actually. We're the object but the whole subject of the Bible is, it was right here at the top of the screen. It's Jesus right here. Well, why is that a big deal? Because Jesus is what your whole Bible is all about. Amen. Well, wait a minute. He didn't show up till the New Testament, you know, after, past the midpoint. No, he's actually, he's in Genesis. When God spoke the world into existence, that was him. He was the fourth man in the fiery furnace in Daniel. See, Jesus shows up all through the Psalms. He was, the, he was what was called the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. There were 300 prophecies in the Old Testament and they all talk about Jesus. We'll talk more about that next week. In John uh, 5, Jesus says this. He says, you search the scriptures. Well, what scriptures are you talking about? Well, there was no New Testament yet. He's talking about the Old Testament. He says, you search the Old Testament scriptures because you think that if you follow those rules externally, you're gonna have eternal life. And Jesus says, no, 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 that's not it. That the, all the scriptures, they all point to me, the whole thing. Well, why is that so important? Because this is how I read my Bible. This is how I want you to read your Bible. I go looking for Jesus. When you read the Bible, look for Jesus. Amen. Read the Bible, find Jesus. Read the Bible, find Jesus. He's all through it. Amen. And I love it because I know Jesus can bring New Testament reality into those Old Testament values into my life. But he doesn't tell me, he doesn't just tell me to do it. He changes me from the inside out where I want to do it. All right, so if that's the plot, if this mirror image is the plot of the Bible and Jesus is the hero of the Bible, what is Jesus' objectives? In every story, the, every movie, the hero has an objective. Save the princess, whatever it is. So what is his objective? Well, Mike, it's love, right? It's love. No, close. That's really the foundation of the objective. It's the motivation of the objective, but it's not the actual objective. The objective is something even greater than love. And that is that God didn't just have love. The most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, okay? God so loved the world that he, what did he do? Gave. Put it in the chat online. He gave love. He didn't just have love, he gave love. He expressed it. He carried it out. And that is why I need everybody, Christians, non-Christians, been in church your whole life, just showed up this week. I need for us all to understand this reality. And you'll never read the Bible the same again if you see it this way. All right, I wanna show it to you. Because it even defines what we do as Christians, as a church. And that is the whole objective of Jesus was that he gave, to give. And that's not only what we receive, it's also what we do. The objective of the Bible is give. 
He gave, he gave, so we give. He gave his life, so we give our life. You see, if you received the gift of his life, your responsibility is to give your life away to as many people as possible. And it's actually not just about salvation because as we're gonna find out as we go through this series, the word of God has power and authority within the world that you live in, okay? The word of God, when you speak it as a result of what you believe, Jesus says it does amazing and miraculous things. And if you don't understand the actual objective that it is to give, you don't understand that that power, that authority, those tools that are given to you, they're actually not for you. They're supposed to go through you for somebody else. We have a saying here that God ministers to people by ministering through people. And you want to be one of the through people, right? Because it's inherent in the Bible and it's the objective of Jesus and the Bible that we give our lives. Power and authority that God has given you through the word of God, it's not an end. It's a means to an end. Your healing is not an end. Your healing is a means to an end, which means so that you can give your life away to others. Amen. Your abundance is not for your end. It is a means for the end, which is so you can give your life away for others. Amen. Your authority, your dominion in this earth, your mental health and mental wealth, it's all so that you can give your life to others Amen. just like he gave his life to us. Because watch this, this is the lens that we have to read the Bible through, okay? He gave, we give. But his most extra extravagant gift, see, he gave something that no one else is even in line to give you. And that is to allow his one and only son, not to die on the cross and just save us from our sins, but to actually be slaughtered while his, his father watched. It was the most extravagant expression of love ever. He gave. Amen. And what's the appropriate response to that kind of gift? That we give. We give what, Micah? We give our life in full Amen. back to him. You see, salvation isn't just joining a church. That's, that's a system and it's a, it's a good thing to do. So much more than that. You see, even to be a believer, well, I believe in the Bible. Well, but that's actually not enough because that's not what it's about is just believing. It's about he gave everything. And so we give everything. And for those of you that received that gift long ago, this is why we exist individually and as a church. We don't exist just to be in the receiving of gifts. You don't come to church just so you can have a church to come to something to do on Sunday morning I'm glad I want you to come here I want you to receive ministry and I hope this church blesses you so much but that's not why you exist we exist as the church to give to give his life and his love to those families in our community to those people that God has placed into your life we give what he paid for back to him in our time and our energy and our money. It's why we encourage you every week to tithe. It's why we encourage you to go to the growth track and find out what, what, you have, what God would have you become. That you could give your life because he paid for it so that you would give your life to other people. It's why part of our vision is that you can become who God made you to be. And that is to give his light, his love to other people. Amen. Because he, give, he gave, we give. It's what the whole book is about. And when I read my Bible, I just think, wow, look how generous he's been to me. And then I see all these instructions that are for us so that we can express his love to other people. In fact, 1 John 3, 3 John 3.16, he gave. 1 John 3.16, therefore we give our lives for one another, for our brothers and our sisters. We give our lives to the people that are harassed and ho feel hopeless and have no shepherd in our community. That's what we do. We give our lives to them. That's why we present you with opportunities to build this amazing adventure for children to be able to learn the word of God in an exciting and fresh way every week that lives would never be the way 
again, the same again. It's why we're feeding people in our community, you know, thousands of families in need over the holidays through the Grace Initiative. That's why we want to build a church overseas with a well next to it. So lives are changed for eternity. We give. He gave to us, so we give. That's why we exist. And that is what your Bible is all about. Is that right? Stand with me. Lord, we want to know our Bibles. We want to understand our Bibles because we want to understand you. God, help us to prioritize your word in our lives. That we're reading your word every single day. That we're making the teaching of the word and, the, and services a priority in our lives. So that we can change our beliefs and believe what you say about us. And not what the world says about us. And we're studying the Bible. God, in a meetup, in classes, and, and how the Bible applies to our lives, marriage and parenting and finances and healing and all those things. And we grow and help us to memorize it and to know your word that our lives are built on a foundation of strength and a stable foundation. And God, I intercede for this church that, I, that Melissa and I deeply love. And God, maybe we're, we're getting ready to face things that we're not sure if we're ready for. But we know that if we have our lives built on your word, that even though those storms come and the winds blow, that our houses will not fall, that we will thrive and not just survive. So God, let us show your love and give your love to as many people as we can as we show your light to the world around us. We know we're called to get as many people into your resort, into, into paradise, into heaven as possible. Give us wisdom. Help us to grow in your word like never before. In Jesus' name.